Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. If we can all take a seat, please. We'll get our, uh, tonight's undertakings underway. Mel. <laughs> Louder. How's that? Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Brickworks Richmond Design Studio for the latest instalment in our international speaker series. My name's Nick Thexton, and along with Matt Hale, we make up the business development team here in Victoria. And on behalf of myself, Matt, Stephanie, Natalie, and the design team, we'd like to thank you all for your ongoing support, not only for our international design speaker series, but also our double talk series and our product launch adventure, uh, events. Uh, I'd also like to thank our guest host tonight, Mr. Stephen Barrity, and our very special guest speaker, Kevin Carmody. I'd also like to point out, while well, I've got you, that the bathrooms are to the left here and also through the doors behind me to the rear of the building. Uh, before I hand you over, we'd like this opportunity to run a short video on the latest addition to the Brickworks range, the new handcrafted Italian bricks by Poesia. These stunning Italian handcrafted glass bricks come in five different colours and three profiles, natural, frosted and polished, uh, which you can see on display around the room tonight or you can contact either myself, Matt, the design studio team, or any of the design studio centres around Melbourne and Geelong. Now we're just going to play a short video for you. Okay, now if you can all please join me in giving a very warm welcome to Mr. Stephen Varity. Thank you. Thanks guys. Thank you to Brickworks. Welcome everybody. What a fantastic turnout. Um, you're not going to be disappointed. I've had the great pleasure of spending um, the last couple of days with uh, Kevin Carmody. He is a gentleman and quite um, a rigorous thinker, and I think you're in for a treat tonight. Brickworks has been running this uh, talks program for over two years now, and it's become more and more successful. It's taken me almost, well, over a year to get Kevin to come to Australia, but we're very fortunate that he's come to join us. Before we get started, there are some seats down the front. Please, those of you standing up the back, um, let's not waste these seats. Come and join us up the front. Don't be shy. Okay, usual story. <laughs> Kevin asked me to invite you down the front. He wants you to be here. He wants you to be close. Look, I'm not gonna uh, speak for very long. Kevin's got a longer than normal presentation, uh, but it is well worth it. Once he gets started, you will not want to leave. So my introduction is going to be very short. Kevin Carmody, for those of you that don't know, is actually an Australian. He studied in Canberra and then at RMIT here in Melbourne. So he's kind of a local. Um, having worked for Metier 3, he then decided to move to the UK. Ended up working in London for a couple of people, one of whom was David Chipperfield. While he was at David Chipperfield's office, he met Andy Grok. You pronounce it Grok. 
as in Howard Rourke, Grok. Comedy Grok was born in 2006. They um, moved out of the Chipperfield studio and started their own practice. Now, they find themselves in a wonderful position of having a great deal of wonderful projects, which, some of which you will see tonight. There is a much broader range of work than what you are going to be shown tonight, so I suggest you take the brochure that's on your chair, um, check out the website, there's a lot of work there you will see, including the project in this image behind me, which will not be spoken about tonight. Um, Kevin's going to talk for about an hour and 20 minutes, then I'm going to sit and have a conversation with him for about half an hour after that. Then you are welcome to come and speak with him afterwards. That's the beauty of the Brickworks presentations, that you are given the opportunity to spend some time with our speaker. So please take advantage of that. Come and speak to him after the presentation. Um, can you all please switch off your phones so we don't have any issues? Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Kevin Carmody. Thank you. Just one little thing. Oh, pardon me. Don't leave too early. Kevin has been um, very wonderful in bringing a couple of uh, publications on the Carmody Grok uh, work. This publication no longer exists. This is the last publication that 2G is publishing as a physical thing. They're going online. So stick around. One of you is going to win this, along with a wonderful gift voucher from Euro. Thank you. Um, great. Um, First of all, um, thank you, Stephen. Thank you, Brickworks, um, and thank you all for coming along. Um, in many ways, this is um, a really um, lovely thing to come home and talk about the work that um, we've been doing in London um, for the past 10, almost 11 years. Um, I'm going to take you through a series of themes the practice has been looking at in its first 10 years tonight. Um, we've entitled the talk um, the Territory of Architecture. Um, why? Uh, we, we've, we've been thinking about this a lot and, and for us, um, somehow, architecture is becoming a reconciliation of sorts. A reconciliation between um, the single, singular, the, the inhabitant, and the many, society. It's a reconciliation between the room and the city, or the landscape. Um, it also makes an observation about how our practice of architecture in London is changing. Um, it's changing in reaction to its physical, um, social and economic um, constraints. And those are giving us a very unique place within society and how we can affect it. Um, it's allowed to approach uh, projects in a very unique way. and. Um, in our opinion, we're right at the periphery of architectural practice. Um, so we'll talk about this territory. Um, I'd like to start by talking about where we are um, in London. Um, this is the context of um, our studio. Um, London, as you might know, is an unruly, messy, and mercantile city. Um, it's shaped by internal and external forces. Um, on the one hand, it's a city like any European city made up of streets and squares. At the same time, it's the confluence of a series of villages which have grown, blended into each other, um, redefining their context. Um, Hogarth's etching um, in 1751 of Gin Lane um, actually shows the church next to our studio behind it in the etching. Um, it's an area near St Giles, east of Soho, just west of Covent Garden. Um, and it was, um, for us, it's an important etching. It's, he was one of the first British artists to actually show real life, or at least a satirical version of real life. Um, in some ways, it's the everyday. It's a debaucherous setting. 
It's a reminder to all of us as architects that the city is an accumulation of things. Um, the things around us, and importantly, it's a backdrop to real life. It's not the foreground. So for us, that's, that's an important measure. Over the centuries, um, this part of town um, was the crossroads. It was the place where people met. It was the confluence of the east-west Roman road and the link to the rest of the UK north. And, and for that reason, um, it was interesting. It's where people met. Um, of course, Hogarth was contemporaneous with Soane, and in fact, a very good friend. Um, many um, friends from Australia visit London and ask us which one building we would suggest visiting. It is without doubt the Soane Museum, which is very close to our studio. Um, it's interesting because as a student, you study that as photographs and drawings and you try to come to terms with what the project means. Um, to this day, for us, the project challenges the preconceptions about internal perspectives, sectional relationships, and of course, thresholds, and how different kinds of space, different kinds of objects um, come together in an unusual way. But it is much about the territory of activities this, of course, was both a gallery, a workplace, a school, and a dwelling. So as a foreigner to London, um, studying this project from the plans and photography as we suggested, um, it left an indelible impression when we moved to London. And somehow the building seems to oscillate between the idea of the room and the city. This is a painting by Gandhi, it's not actually by Soane. Um, Gandhi was one of his students and probably most talented draftspeople working um, in his studio. Um, it depicts all the buildings that Soane designed between 1808 and 1815. If anyone can pick any others, let me know. Um, that's what we believe. It was painted in 1820. Um, um, some of the representations are shown as large models and we know his model studio was quite like that. Others are shown somehow as part of a um, an accumulation. Um, for us, it seems to capture the energies, the possibilities, and the successes, and ultimately the failures, many of these buildings weren't built, of working in a mercantile city like London. Um, and importantly, it combines these ideas, these buildings, these pieces of architecture, as a microcosm of a city within a room. Um, for us, that seems really interesting. This is our studio um, today uh, in Covent Garden. Um, we don't have a reception desk. This is, this is what you see when you arrive. Um, and in many ways, it seemed a really relevant way to represent our work today. Um, a collection of models, an accumulation of experiences over 10 years, and a series of ideas condensed within a single hall or room. Um, Stephen introduced, I came from Australia. Um, I moved in 1999 after graduating from RIT. Andy actually came from Manchester, studied in Sheffield. So he's not from London either. And in many ways, um, we've always been outsiders. Um, we've ever, always kind of been bringing different observations to our experiences there. Um, and, and these observations are reconciled in a conversation between us. <clears throat> Our studio is working on a diversity of projects and um, scales, geographic locations now, um, from this space in London. Um, today, I'd like to talk to you about some seemingly very different projects. Um, uh, th this range of projects have come out of an opportunity of working in London, the kind of collaborations, the kind of people you can work with there. Um, but these projects have influenced the territory of practice for our studio, what we're interested in and what we're now looking at. Um, so in some ways, London as a place, as a territory, has also influenced us as much as the, not as, uh, sorry, not only the physical environment, um, but also the diverse social and cultural territory of this place. Um, before I introduce the first project, I think it, it's, it's interesting to look back and reflect when you uh, 
come to do a talk like this. And um, this is one of the first projects Andy Grok and I did together. Um, and it's a project in Australia. It never got built. Um, the client had a series of very large agricultural buildings in Cowra, Western Australia. Uh, Western New South Wales, I should say. I've been in Western Australia this week. Um, and the buildings, the buildings were being converted into recording studios for a big Chinese production company who was going to make television in Cowra. Um, the brief was to build buildings for people because these were broadly sheds in a very intense climate. Um, but they already had a lot of space, actually, from what we could see. And we resisted building any new buildings. We, we basically created a, a, a new structure, a, a simple, primitive shelter around the northern aspect of the project. Um, I guess this new simple shelter of sorts summed up lots of what the next 10 years of our work um, explored. Um, we were interested in this idea of how, how architecture could, could define territory, that it could be a thing that connected, it defined but not enclosed. It was a primitive shelter in ways, but it was always considering how it linked people to people and people to place, the room to the landscape. So talking about... Um, unusual projects um, from one of our very first projects I've just shown you to actually one of our most recent. This has only just come out in the press and um, we're uh, looking to build it later this year. Um, this is Helensborough. So we're 25 miles or 40 kilometers roughly, don't do the calculation, uh, west of Glasgow. Um, the town faces south towards the Clyde um, south is where the sun comes from, okay? Um, the town was planned on a radical grid system for its time. Um, and it was seen by the developing, the developer of the time as, as using the topography to increase the value of the plots. Actually, it could be Chicago without the density. Um, it predates the plan of Chicago by 150 years. Um, this is the view down from that amazing grid as it intersects the topography and falls down to the, to the Clyde. Um, I think one has to come to terms with how important a house like this is by understanding how it was made and the time and place that it was made in. So Charles Rennie McIntosh's Hill House was 1902 to 1904 house was built for a publisher in Glasgow. Glasgow was too polluted, so people were living in Helensborough and commuting back to Glasgow. The house is contemporaneous with early houses of Ados Luce, as well as maybe Edward Lutyens was building many of the kind of neoclassical re renaissance in the UK. I guess it's defined at a point in history where we see the death of Victoria, the death of the British Empire, or the Victorian era as we know it. It was in fact the ascendancy of the middle classes and in our opinion, the beginning of the battles of style in architecture. Um, he was 32 years old when this project was completed. So he designed it at some beginning at say 28. Um, he'd just done the grand tour of, uh, of, of Grand Tour of Europe and had become fascinated by the neoplastic forms of southern Europe, European architecture, particularly northern African architecture. Um, and I guess we need to see it in the context of the end of the Victorian period, industrialization, the arts and crafts movement being a reactionary um, process to that industrialization and also the, the Art Nouveau mo movement as, as, as the new avant-garde. Um, I think one could probably say there are similarities in the plan to Webb's Red House. Pesner would say that's probably the beginning of modernism in housing. Um, for us, there's some distinct differences, however, and I'd like to maybe talk about a couple of those today. I don't have a pointer, so I'm gonna try and use the, do I? 
Oh, great, wonderful. Can I use that? Yeah, great. Um, the, house, the house is um, unusually arranged around an L form. Um, that doesn't seem unusual now, does it? Um, but, but we've got to put places in the context that Luchens was doing neoclassical forms of houses. Um, it was the first house that started to look at modern patterns of life. It started to think about what the inhabitants was doing. So the house actually looked um, and front, fronted and looked down towards the view and had a formal frontage, albeit not um, uh, classical in its arrangement, but it actually entered from the side. That's because they drove cars. This is a house that responded to arriving and not having servants. This is a house that thought about the connection of the space as you enter the house, actually having spaces to use within the hallway that are rooms that are part of your everyday life. Um, the inhabitant was a publisher and they thought a lot about books, so it had libraries, it had connections. Many of these things made it quite radical. Probably the, the, the most outstanding element of that was, was the render, the kind of neoplastic form that he'd brought from Southern Europe. This was the first use of cement render rather than lime render in Scotland. Um, and, um, you know, in that sense, it's, it, it was quite radical. Um, but this project came out of its place. It had steep slate roofs, shallow eaves, rough texture in the render, small gridded windows, and unadorned chimneys. Yeah, all of these seem to be quite a functional response to this climate and this place. Um, hopefully some of you have been to the west coast of Scotland. Um, it's quite an intense climate. Um, however, he managed to abstract the forms. The, the chimneys and the parapets Became, became kind of figurative in their composition. They combined to make new elements within the house. They abstracted the rooms inside, pushing in and out to make form of the building. In some senses, there was baronial, local, contextual, historical references. At the same time, it was sort of radical. It was challenging everything that had come before it. Um, it was, in, in fact, the the inspiration of the house to, to challenge in many ways. And none, is, um, none of those aspects is least interesting than the, the interiors of the project. Um, Glasgow at the time was building a lot of ships and they were being um, sent all over the world. Um, in fact, most of them were being sent to Japan. And Scotland had a whole period of architects interested in Japanese architecture. Charles Rennie Macintosh was merely one of those. And see, we, we see a very strong influence in the, in the timber work, in the paneling, in the detailing, actually. Um, not only from the early arts and crafts houses in the area, but also Japan. He had this sense that the ground floor should be masculine. Not our opinion, his. So you see dark paneling these wonderful little spaces for reading and taking moments on the stairs. These libraries built around the collection specifically of, of, of this uh, uh, publisher. Um, even specific spines were put on the books for this house. Um, and then you ascend into a more feminine space. Um, it is, in fact, a complete piece of work. Um, the house um, combines not only the design of, of the form of the building, the rooms, but all of the textiles, the wallpapers, the light fittings, the fixtures, and even the cutlery. Um, in that sense, he and his wife, who was credited with designing many of those elements, um, proposed a pretty radical house for its time. Um, in the words of our client, the current building is dissolving like an aspirin. Due to its radical formal approach, the plastic forms, the neoplastic forms of the walls and parapets, the damp proof courses or lack thereof, the Portland cement render itself 
seems to have actually been the challenge and downfall of the project. The water has slowly penetrated all of the surfaces and over, it, over the life of the building, it has now hit all of the internal surfaces. We have damage in not only all the timber work, the wallpapers, all of the one-off pieces of fixtures and fittings, we see radical damage in the, in the facade. That render is not built for a Scottish climate. Basically what's happened is it's got wet and it's frozen. As it's frozen, the water's expanded and it's cracked. Freeze, crack, thaw, freeze, crack, thaw, and over time, we end up with water soaking through the brick. A brick house or a stone house, and this combines both, would naturally dry out with a lime mortar, or without, actually. Um, this house actually is trapping water inside it, it between the brick, the stone, and the render. Um, and unfortunately, at the moment, its preservation is now at critical stage. So a short while ago, we won a competition to design a pavilion. Um, the National Trust of Scotland ran the competition, and their idea for the competition was to design a pavilion next to the house. That was to bring people to the house whilst it's being conserved. No one knows how long this house will take to conserve. Um, the experts say in the order of 15 years to dry out and repair. Um, but we resisted the idea of making another object and putting it next to the house. We thought it would be better to think about something that combined the idea of a visitor experience and enhanced that with the conservation of the building. We started by explaining to the client that if one was to incarcerate the building within scaffolding, which is what one normally does in a conservation project, the buttressing alone would take up most of the garden. And it would look like that. So we instead proposed something more radical. We wanted to reduce the structure to a minimum and allow that to be inhabited by the visitor. It's a new steel structure, an inhabited wall, a house over a house, a new shelter and a territory form between. It's an enclosure of sorts, the making of a room for a house. The project exists, I guess, between forming a relationship between the new and the old. Um, it's a new territory for us between the conservation of the building and the visitor. So before I talk about that project, I'd like to talk a little bit about how ideas develop in our studio. Um, this is a Skywalk project. We did it in um, 2007 for the London Festival of Architecture. We'd been going 12 months. Um, we were asked to do an object pavilion designer a kiosk, if you will, for people to get information. Um, behind the British Museum for a total of three days of lifespan. Um, we had seven days to build it. Um, instead of designing an object, we thought we'd think about the street and how we could make the city work harder for us. The project made a wall, a wall that could be inhabited. It took you up into the trees so you could look at the city in a different way. Look down at the British Museum and make, make an observation of a space that was normally used for bus car parks, coach parking, for the British Museum. The enclosure made rooms within the street for different activities. Some of those were book reading, some of them were architectural presentations very similar to this. Some of those were dance and theatre performances. It existed only for three days, but it reassured us that, that architecture is a social experience, that the idea of enclosing space and defining territories can be as simple as a wall, and inhabiting that connects people to activity and people to place. So we return to, to Charles Rennie McIntosh's house. This is actually the roof plan of our proposed building, um, completely over the existing house. Um, we do need to provide a small kiosk. They still have a bookshop um, and, a, and a cafe and bathrooms. 
um, you can see the new enclosure that's going to be built around the, the form of the plan of the house. Um, uh, as we go up to the first floor, you see the relationship of, of, of some of the upper rooms and then the walkways. And as we get to the roof, you will see that there's a walkway that even goes over the roof of the building. The roof of the enclosure is a solid element. Um, we need to keep the rain off the building whilst it's being conserved. However, the enclosure of the wall is a mesh, and we've gone with a chainmail mesh that allows bees, but not birds, because there's landscape that we want to keep alive within the, the building. The visitor experience connecting platforms and ramps increases the visitor's numbers to the site through its restoration bringing the visitor into a, a close proximity with the restoration and, in fact, the artifact. A thin, diaphanous skin, which is a counterpoint to the, to the permanent structure. This territory is somehow a counterpoint between the heavy construction of the building of the house and the lightweight building somehow supporting its life. It's conceptually different, in our opinion, to enclosing it in scaffolding. It's not a plastic bag. It's not solid. The mesh allows a visual connection to the house from the distant landscape and to the distant landscape from within the house whilst it's being conserved. It will optically shift through the day. The form of the enclosure and the house will con be in constant dialogue. And the mesh, as I've described, will assist that restoration in drying the building out. You can see the walkway over the roof. Um, for us, projects like this um, really are in the radical tradition of, of Cedric Price. And what better project to look at than his fun palace to think about an idea like this. And it's in that radical tradition that we see the visitor experience of our project blending between revealing the processes of conservation um, with, with, I guess, the unique experience of seeing this house and continuing to see it through its conservation. Um, I guess it's a museum. It's, it's taking, um, considering that a museum is primarily a social experience. All of these things can be seen through plans, through photographs. We're coming to visit a museum to come into contact with the substance of the thing, the substance of architecture, and share that experience socially. Um, so in one way, we're seeing one thing whilst coming to terms with another and seeing other visitors as much as the artefact. Um, this project is working hand in hand with the National Trust business plan and in interestingly, it's actually raising the money through the, through the process of conservation. It can allow more visitors through it and, it and it's aimed to drive that. I guess we talk about the primary tenets of architecture. It's a shelter of sorts. Um, but it's a new form out of the territory form between the old wall and the new wall. It thinks about how we made the wall then and how we now make a wall to support that old wall. Um, I feel it's radical in the way that it considers conservation of our heritage and our culture as a society. It inverts the conventional idea of a museum by making it a house as an exhibit within the territory of the museum. It's not a permanent building. And I guess because we don't feel one's needed. But there is a discussion about when you take it down. They still don't even know if they can put the render that was originally on the building back. Or should we put something new? This building allows for that debate now. So we can come to terms with what we should do. Um, a lot of our work is in listed buildings. Um, it's kind of probably common sense working in London and the UK, but um, uh, over 50%, actually. Um, so a lot of the time we're trying to come to terms with the time and place that these buildings were built. Um, <clears throat> this is um, Hill House in Sheffield. Um, uh, it's a, the biggest listed building in Europe. Um, it was built post-war. The housing that originally stood on this site um, was um, the most deprived, the most crime-ridden area of the UK. 
Um, shortly after the Second World War, the council, and I quote, began the process of slum clearance. So they actually demolished a whole series of Victorian houses that ref were referred to as slums. Um, including the densely occupied terra terrace housing on the site, relocating families with a hope that the new high-rise building would be the saviour of economic, social and cultural issues of the region and the city. Um, that's a big responsibility for architecture. I'm not sure we're in control of all of those things. Um, however, that sort of summed up the optimism at the time. Architects Jack Lynn and Ivor Smith may have seen that Ivor Smith passed away a couple of weeks ago. Um, under the supervision of a city architect, I'm going to talk about city architects later, they're a good thing, Sheffield City Council's city architect was named John Lewis Wormsley. Um, they began work in 1953 designing the Park Hill Flat Scheme. Importantly, it was a time when the city architect um, and young architects working within the council were respected. They were respected and given great opportunity. Both of the architects were 25 years old when they began this project, and they commenced building when they were only 27 years old. There was an optimism in this approach, a, a feeling that we're working towards a greater good. I guess this is partly born out of an idea that architecture could solve social, economic, cultural problems of the city. And it's, in some senses, it's no surprise that these young architects had visited Corbusier's Unité de Habitation just a short year before designing the project. We've been working with Arup, who set up an office specifically to design this building in Sheffield, and we've been going through their archives. What we've learned through that process is that this was built at a time when rationing was in place. We had to kind of put our mindset into understanding what that meant. Um, rationing applied to everything in life. Rationing applied to food, it applied to clothes, it applied to resources and construction materials. So in order to build something in that time, you had to justify exactly how many families you could house using that much material. It's been an interesting conversation because it's basically made us realize that we currently, so as society, as architects, we design with flexibility in mind, as a given, compared to this building at least. This building had such a pro an approach to construction efficiency, or lack of flexibility, if you will, that it only allowed for 25 mil cover of concrete on all the reinforcement across the whole building. This, of course, reduced its flexibility and indeed its lifespan, but it was all that could be afforded to house these families. So 995 families, three pubs, 31 shops and a school. The building is a city in microcosm. Wings canted at obtuse angles. We're not clear why obtuse angles, but we have obtuse angles. Um, to maximize panoramic views, we believe, of the city in the southern Pennines. <clears throat> I guess stair columns at the elbows make sense, and um, even roads that went as streets up into the sky. It was a microcosm of a city. Um, our site is, is on the west side, and we'll talk about that in a second. I think to come to terms with a building like this, you need to realize how radical a proposition it was. The site had a very steep hill on it and at the top end of the site the building is four stories high. At the bottom end of the site with the roof level the building falls to 14 stories. It uses that topography to bring roads into the main three circulation streets of the project. So at certain points down, down the project you can drive cars onto the building that connects all the way around the project and you can drive back out onto it. So it was literally the extension of streets using topography. Streets in the sky were not new, but I think the radical intervention of topography with the grid was pretty new. 
Um, we have to come to terms as we're starting to work on projects like this with how things are built in their time and place, as, I'm, as I mentioned. Um, this building is built on a very, very tight structural grid to hold it together. And in fact, that is the listed element of the building. All the other pieces of the building can be taken off. The building was going to be knocked down in the 1990s, and it was saved by English Heritage. You can see the milk car driving on to the, to the main street. So in understanding that, um, this was phase one done by the developer. Um, and you can see it was taken right back to its structural frame. We had to come to terms with what we had and what we could work with. So in beginning the project, we, we had to think, I think, mostly about what that grid could give us. We, our client has been gifted this project for 100 years for a peppercorn rent from the council. That's a great thing. We're working for an arts organization that are trying to promote young artists and give them space to work, to develop their careers, and show their art. It's called S1, and it's taking this whole wing. Um, when we presented the competition, we um, talked a lot about this project, and I think, I think it's worth just touching on. Um, if you don't know it, it's the Palais de Tokyo by La Coton en Versailles in Paris. Um, it's in some ways, it's a f it found space. It's a reuse of an existing shell. Um, but somehow it celebrated that raw shell. It celebrated socializing the building with the least impact on the existing building, making unselfconscious spaces for artists to inhabit and cultivate their work. They have enough substance in the building to graft onto. It is an interesting observation to us that the brief for this project was exactly the same brief they set for the Pompidou. Yet the directors of this museum felt the Pompidou had failed in providing spaces that artists could work in. That's living artists providing new, making new work within a space. Um, as you know, Palais de Tokyo is a, is a radical success and, and is nurturing new artists and new work all the time and engaging in a social way, that experience. So we, we talked about what, how you could do the most with the least, what the idea of keeping something was. Park Hill has this kind of radical grid, but it has a really interesting series of infrastructures. Um, H, H um, block um, structural grids, which the stairs fit into, rises that connect through the building vertically. So it works both vertically and horizontally as a building. The flats themselves, wine bottle in a kind of Cambusian way, um, but actually they're a three by three grid. So they're designed as three stories high by three grids wide. So it's a Rubik's cube. Four flats are entered from the middle floors from the street and connect up and down. So what we started to think about was our project only needed to provide the bare minimum of infrastructure. Artists could work in almost anything. So we started with a project that just thought about how you could begin with that, that grid and you could start to explore how the territories of the building could be defined by the structure. And we could expand vertically and horizontally into that, using double height spaces where we need them. So these are a series of unique, differentiating artist spaces for them working, socializing the building and connecting people, I guess, between people, but also making spaces that they can adapt and work in. We can't even afford paint, so we don't. We're just leaving what's there for them to graft onto and work with. The interesting thing about this project is that it's in two parts. So we have this radical project we're trying to graft onto to use its grid to define new spaces for people to work into. We also need to exhibit their work. And so where the old school was placed in the, in the middle of the, the landscape, we proposed the idea of a new gallery. We had been thinking about gallery spaces and we'd visited some very interesting ones over the last couple of years. This is Louisiana. Um, 
If this isn't on your bucket list, please put it on there. Um, it has a radical approach to, to landscape and, and, and the visitor route. It thinks about how you show work whilst looking at a place. It thinks about the context of one's landscape and how that reflects back into the building. Um, and it thinks about the visitor route being both distinct and unique. This is the figure ground of the building in phase two. It's recently been adapted into a phase three. Um, but importantly, it brings artwork into a direct relationship with, with the viewer and the viewed. So you're seeing that looking at work, looking at people, looking at work, coming to terms with your time and place together. This is the most recent um, addition, which um, interestingly, for those who haven't been there, makes a connection between the two old wings. So you now have a loop that you can go either way around the building. Um, we had seen that project many years before, and we were asked to work with Freeze Art Fair for three years to build their temporary art fair in Regent's Park. So this is Regent's Park, and this is a this is a project that we build in less than seven days in the park. It's actually another city. It's as big as the O2 Dome, designed by Grimshaw in, in London and built in seven days. Um, we plan out streets and avenues and squares between all the stalls. We talk about sp social spaces and art spaces. Um, in our first year, we proposed an idea of making new spaces in the landscape that would connect people back from within the the main marquees, the main tent spaces, back to Re Regent's Park itself. This is during construction. The tents are 45 meter spans. So even just doing a site walk around takes uh, an hour. We proposed these new pavilions. They were made out of fairly simple construction materials. In fact, the materials were reused for three years. We built them different ways each year. Um, the spaces enclosed I've had to for security reasons. Um, new rooms, rooms for s cafes, for, for meeting, for getting out of the art space, for creating new um, environments. And they created courtyards that looked inwards. Inwards at nature and inwards at each other. Um, we didn't make any special elements. We just stacked more of the same element to do beams. Again, we were reusing the structure. But importantly, we came to this point where we were taking the trees out of Regent's Park and bringing them into the art fair as part of the experience, part of the exhibit. And we thought that was really exciting and, and relevant, actually. So we returned to Park Hill and um, think about landscape. We've thought about the grid and we, we come to terms with, with where to place a gallery this is the old footprint of the garages and was historically where the school located. And we thought that it would be most interesting to start to think about something that made a connection back to its place. So it knitted into the topography of the site. It dealt with not only access on above it, but access around it. But it created views framed moments whilst we're looking at art, we're reminding of where we are in, in the world. And it connected to courtyards, where we see the structural frame, the grid of this historic building connecting um, and leading out into the landscape. Um, and importantly, it defined a new entrance, a new use for this building um, as a public building, not as housing. I guess confronted with rehabilitating one of the largest um, listed structures in Europe, or at least a small part of it, we found it a daunting task to start with. We had to come to terms with the intentions philosophically about the original building and the physical properties of its construction, the limits and strengths of that grid and its ability to organize clusters of overlapping social spaces as well as the proportioning elements of the rooms and territories within the building. Somehow the counterpoint to this grid is landscape and the ability for the project to redefine a new type of space as a counterpoint to this listed building, somewhere between the grid and the landscape itself. So <clears throat> um, 
This project's finishing this year. Um, this is the first of a series of museum projects the studio's been working on. We won the project in competition some six years ago. Um, must be almost that. Um, it takes a long time to build things in the UK. Um, to give some context again to those who haven't been there, um, we're in the Lake District, the north of England. We're very close to the Scottish border. It's one of the most beautiful parts um, of the UK. It actually has a UNESCO World Heritage listing for the landscape. Um, interestingly, um, it had a railway built from Manchester up here in 1847. And the only reason they built that was to bring gravels back from this part of the world. There's a lot of rich resources there that they were going to use in, in building new things in the city. That railway opened up this area to the wealthy industrialists and some of the best arts and crafts houses by Voise, etc., are situated around this lake. Yeah. The site for the museum was in an interesting context because it was actually a working site. It was one of the sites that they extracted gravels from the lake. Um, I'd like to show you some of the early concept sketches of this project and then maybe return to where we are. Right from the beginning uh, of the, uh, the competition, we, we always thought that this should be a series of buildings. In fact, we thought the brief was too big for this site. Right on the lake foreshore, um, three and a half thousand square meters of museum felt like it would just be too big a thing. So our intuition was to do a series of buildings, not one somehow interconnected. The site had a wonderful series of views, both north up the lake, but it was also approached from all sides. So you could arrive by ferry, arrive by car or bus, and also walk from Kendall across the landscape. So you get this amazing idea that the building doesn't have a back or a front. Actually, somehow it's a solitaire, and I think we had to come to terms with that as we were designing it. We also had some intuitions about forms, and these are some of the competition sketches that we proposed. Um, this is the wettest place in the UK. So we thought that a boat museum, a museum showing historic steamboats on water, should allow people to be outside and understand that landscape and experience it both inside and outside the museum. So carved forms making rooms a cluster of buildings sitting on a podium, bringing it out of the water. A series of forms that not only frame views from the buildings to the landscape, but also frame views between and under the forms of the buildings to landscape. This is the original wet dock building that's there. There was a museum already on the site when we were commissioned. It was falling down. And this wet dock building spanned over what was a, the original extraction point for the in industry. This is what they were doing there, removing gravels. And this is really its heritage. It's not a picturesque place. It had this kind of wealth of industrial forms. But these are the boats we're talking about. They are fantastic. They are such beautiful craft. They come from a period of Victorian history where it was seen as quaint to take your loved one out on the lake, okay, on a steamboat. Maybe you're driving, maybe someone else is driving for you, but these boats, most of them are actually able to tap the boiler through a copper pipe to actually fill your teapot and have a cup of tea on the lake. Um, so thinking about how things look from the lake was one of the most important things. And, and we see uh, one of the larger scale models through development and the wet dock, which is foregrounded in the project, right in the middle of this cluster of forms. A series of buildings that kind of work between the landscape and, and the, uh, the wet dock on each side. Um, to quickly explain those buildings and um, each of their functions, um, there's a lot of boats. They're inside, they're outside, they're in water. Um, so this is a coats on museum. Each of the forms of the building has a nave, has a central hall, a room framing a view. The entrance building, the main gallery, this is the conservator's slipyard, conservator's workshop, the wet dock, this is the education building, the connection link space, and the cafe. 
Um, it's no mean feat to get a planning permission through on a building like this within a UNESCO World Heritage Site, and um, it is actually a national park. We had to talk to all of the local residents about this project, and somehow it felt right that it was from an industrial heritage, not, not a picturesque one. Um, having said that, it needs, needed to be a public building, and it needed to feel like one. Um, and we thought that these, these overhanging forms created rooms that could be used in really interesting ways for, for the museum. So somehow the building form itself became a reconciliation between the territory of the nave, the room, framing a view at the landscape, and the idea of connecting to landscape in these territories and the, under the overhangs. Um, some of the um, planning renders um, that we've been developing. <clears throat> so, this is an idea that we've been developing for quite a while, and somehow these, these ideas um, come round in our studio. This is probably the fastest project we ever built. Um, from first briefing to opening night was 10 weeks. Um, it's a 600 square meter restaurant. Um, the brief when we took on the project was to design a bar inside a wedding marquee on the roof of Westfield's car park. Westfield's site was adjacent to the Olympic site, um, a year and a half out from the opening of the Olympics, and they were just completing their first phase, and they wanted to acknowledge the completion of that with a party. Yeah. Um, we asked them how much they were spending on the wedding marquee. It was about £100,000. We realised we were in the biggest building site in Europe, and we decided that we would try and beg, borrow, and steal materials from the site to build a pavilion. We thought about what it was to be on a roof looking at a particular time in a city's history this unique. Um, Zaha's aquatic stadium, if I just pop back for a second, had the roof on, but none of the enclosures at the sides. It looked extraordinary. The stadium was being built as well as many of the other projects, but it also looked west back to London so I had this connection back to the city through its distant views. So we thought about the idea of what dining is. They wanted to do some dinners here. What would be the experience of being on a roof and being at dinner? And we thought back to how horrible a, a rotating restaurant is as an experience, as a social experience. The idea of sitting opposite someone and having a conversation, but looking out the window the whole time and all that energy dissipating. So we decided to actually close down the views and think about rooms, rooms that allowed you to actually have a shared social experience for, for dining and then connect at certain moments back to those. So we built this in some, I think, five weeks on site with some extraordinary scaffolding guys. All of the materials are borrowed from site the boards, the scaffolding obviously, and the heat shrinking PVC was being used to protect the steels on the stadium. So we borrowed some of that as well. Um, the rooms are simple forms, but they are, the idea is a, is a kind of simple nave, focusing one's view in a direction, take, to take a view, to take a moment out of that. The central space becomes a confluence of those rooms, and the form is as simple as an umbrella. It keeps rain off you for the event. The project was only there for three weeks, served a thousand dinners, and then it disappeared. So we returned to Windermere, and those ideas implicit about thinking about the room as defining the form, and the idea of that territory expanding out into the landscape, and um, sorry, these are from the summer, so um, bear with me. Um, they're, they're a few months out. Um, the project completes in about two months. This is the wet dock. This is the main gallery space, um, the cafe without the windows yet. Um, you will see where those windows will be, connecting us back to landscape. The conservator's workshop that extends to the slipway. Um, so we had to think about what the material of this project was through this process. And, and um, initially we thought it should be stainless steel because we thought, wow, something really resistant to this environment because it's so wet up there. And as we came to terms with Windermere, we realized everything in this environment turns green. Everything. Wood, stone, slate, 
and definitely stainless steel. Um, so we thought that was an interesting starting point and we looked at um, the Pensions Institute and looked at the kind of Nordic way of using copper. And we thought there was a really extraordinary humanity to the way that that had been formed out of a sheet material. Um, I'll explain what I mean by that. The piece, that feel, it feels like it's been folded into ingots that one could pick up. They are, they are elements that, that, that feel like they're almost scaled to your hand. And in addition to that, it's been fixed in a very um, simple way. It's pinned with screws, and those screws inflect the material because it's so thin. So it has character through its maker's marks. We thought about that material giving scale, proportioning to the building, how it would wear over time. Um, should it start quite bright? Should it patinate to this color? At what point would it come to a kind of verdigris? Um, interestingly, from what we've been told by the material scientists, it's too clean in Windermere now, and it probably won't go to green. Um, this is an early mock-up. It's been on site two years. So I wanted to show you the color it's gone in, in two years. It's more like a two penny piece, two cent piece, maybe. You don't have those anymore. Um, so, and you can see, you can see the, the, the fixings and the proportioning elements, the scaling. Um, so we wanted those, though, that material to really feel like it was made in a, in a hand, hand way, in a crafted way. And I guess with such a simplicity of form, that was important to us. The material idea would predominate in the substance of the building and it became really the main character for the building. This ingressive environment in some ways led us to this material and we're really comfortable with the fact that this will now wear in a really unusual way. In fact, the site has a leeward and a windward side and the building itself will wear more on one side than the other. We use the gravels from the lake to make all of the sedimentary base of the building that it sits on. This base holds the building up out of the floodplain and sets a datum for the buildings to create these new territories, these spaces for people to look back to the landscape. The buildings frame views um, across the spaces um, and between the buildings. Um, and the buildings themselves, I guess, are starting to form um, some sort of composition of cluster or a series of typological forms that make sense coherently as a whole. Um, it's not normally that sunny, so that's what it's normally like when we visit site. So um, you can see how it, how it should be when you're, um, when you're visiting. And in fact, as you come back to the landscape, the building's responsibility to actually be background, background to this incredible um, view. So I'd like to zoom back a scale, if I can. Um, I think, I think um, in talking about um, a museum is a very specific thing. I'd like to, like to talk about the green belt. Um, I don't know how many people know about the green belt in London, um, so I'll try and give some context to what I'm talking about. In 1944, Abercrombie put forward, once again, a fairly radical plan um, that created a new six-mile buffer zone around London. It was a, it was a territory. It was a, it was a region that you weren't allowed to build in. The green belt extended around London as the buffer zone, and it was a way of addressing suburban sprawl. We thought this would be really relevant to Australia. Feels like that's the major challenge of all the cities I've visited so far. Models have existed in Europe in places such as Vienna with the Ringstrasse as early as 1860, where the idea of the green belt was as much as making infrastructural loops, connections, and public spaces as being a buffer to development. But the principle of controlling urban sprawl has always been a critical one in most cities. And the Green Belt of London was instigated at a time when London had a city architect. It no longer has a city architect. A single responsible figure for the vision of development, density, infrastructure, and the public open spaces of a city. I think it's really critically important that we have this. 
Since 1955, London's Green Belt has been extended significantly, stretching some 35 miles out of places. London's Green Belt now covers 516 hectares. To put that in context, the Green Belt is three times the size of the city. London's not the only city to have a Green Belt. In fact, all the major cities have Green Belts. This is a zoom in showing all the London boroughs and the scale of the Green Belt in comparison. I think we're at a point where we have to call into question the relevance of the Green Belt again. Along with housing, infrastructures and resources are the next major challenges of our cities. The Mayor of London, believe it or not, under Boris Johnson, produced a series of principles of sustainability and investment that were targets for each of the borough councils. These included the provision of of sustainable resources. So in simple terms, each of the boroughs had to source a certain amount of sustainable resources themselves from either within their borough or if that couldn't be done from close proximity. It's quite interesting. It's a, it's a fairly you know, revolutionary plan that this mayor put in place. I guess this project looks at the responsibility of an architect. And Questions, who's your client? Is it actually your client or is it the needs of a wider society? It questions who ultimately, or what ultimately, is the territory that an architect should be working in. So that's our site. And just before I talk about that, um, that project, I'd like to just talk about the territory an architect works within. Um, it's pretty close to Heathrow. Um, its scale is here. I don't know if I, I should have put some Sydney parks here, shouldn't I? Sorry about that. Um, okay, Victoria Park, um, Clapham Common. So it, it, is, it is a radically big piece of land. So about five years ago, we, we approached a developer in London in, uh, called Argent um, in King's Cross who were doing one of the biggest redevelopments of London um, in recent times. Um, and uh, we went to them with a project. Um, not only did we go to them with a project, we had a business plan. Uh, we had funding, we had an operator, and we asked if we could have a site. So we asked if we could take over an old petrol station for just a couple of years, and they didn't have to do anything. But we wanted to do that to test if architecture could solve some of the problems of, of a place like this in, in, in what was quite a shift in, in its identity through massive reconstruction. So we took this space and we thought the first thing we want to do is to take down a wall. Um, it's a wall on the edge of Canal, Regent's Canal. Um, and unfortunately the wall was creating quite a lot of social problems. This side of the canal where there was a towpath was pretty unsafe as a consequence of that wall. So we took down that wall and we made an enclosure. We turned the enclosure so that we made a public space onto the canal rather than a forecourt onto the road. It was a simple project. We used fiberglass because we couldn't afford MDF or plywood. We held it up with temporary scaffolding. And in fact, we used the old shop to make a restaurant and we charged people a lot of money for food. And it was good food. But we used that profit to run a cultural space under the canopy where we did talks like this and book readings and film nights. And we programmed it. And you had suddenly a democratic space, a democratic space that these people had to walk across to get to the restaurant and a dialogue between those going on so that it was busy and always active and vivid it had a strong connection to the canal, and it created a public space and a thoroughfare along the canal that meant by the time we finished, well, within three months of finishing, people were living on the canal again. It was that safe. So it was a test. It was a test of whether architecture could change city. It was a test whether the master plan could be affected. Interestingly, the master plan has been affected, and the client is now considering a public space and a thoroughfare 
along the edge of this canal in their long-term master plan. Unfortunately, we're not the architects doing it. I returned to Hounslow in West London, okay? Our enormous site, 2.1 kilometers in length. Um, what's really interesting is that we won this project in competition nine years ago, nine years ago. And we won the project in thinking about how you could get gravels out of the ground. The site is in complete private ownership and 98% of the site is not publicly accessible, despite it being in Greenbelt. So really it's only a visual amenity, and it's a questionable visual amenity, because there's no trees on it. It's agriculturally zoned, and you can't farm here. It's right in the middle of the city. But what it does have is 10 meters deep of gravels across the whole site. So the gold here is samples taken across the whole site. Gold is not gold, it's gravel. So we won this competition with an idea that applied architectural thinking to minerals extraction. So we said to them, why don't we top down construct like you do in a city when time is important? Time isn't important here, but maybe we could remove the gravels in a different way. So we, we said, what if we set up a hoarding on the park, 100 meters by 100 meters? We remove the topsoil, we contiguous pile around that cell we put in piles, we put back a slab on top of that, and let's put the topsoil and the grass back. And then we'll put a park on top, okay? And we'll slowly dig the gravels out. And everyone said, okay, well, we've got the gravels out, that's great, there's 50 million pounds worth of gravels. So, quite a lot. Um, but then they said, well, what are you gonna do with that? Well, we thought that this was the best thing to do with that space. At the moment in the UK, the only two things they do with minerals extraction sites, mines, is they allow them to become lakes. Okay, that could be nice. You certainly can't do that near Heathrow. Big, big lakes create big birds, and birds and planes don't go together. So the only other thing they do is to do landfill. Landfill's not good for anyone. So we thought this was actually a fairly smart approach. So we have three million square foot of basement, 10 meters high under a park. Um, we got planning permission six months ago and we're beginning on site in six months. Um, the project creates a series of cells of space beneath, beneath the park. Um, those basement spaces are infrastructure for the city. They, they allow distribution, they allow connections. They allow the council to move their salt stores and put them in the basement so we can build housing for people on the sites that don't need light yeah, and aren't in the green belt. But probably most importantly, we're making a park. So we've got our client to agree to make the biggest new parks since Victorian times, since Victoria Park actually for London, paid for in perpetuity by the management of the space below, given public access for everyone. This community here is um, one of the poorer areas of this borough, if not London, first generation immigrant community generally. This is a fairly middle class group of people who play golf most week weekends on the green belt. At the moment, this site is a buffer between these two communities. They don't mix. The site is actually a barrier in the city. So our intention was to create a park that connected people, that allowed people to walk from their house to their school through a community, and that that leisure space created a unique experience, a social experience for the city. So these are some of the study models we've been developing with Vought Landscape Architecture. On, on the topography of those cells, the spaces between the cells and how they work, the scale of the basement um, below ground and the park above, um, the phasing, which um, I don't have time to go to the detail of, but it's, um, it's near a 15-year project. Um, and importantly, the landscape, the primary connections between people and the view back. <clears throat> and the view back to London, I should say. Um, I guess the Greenbelt was invented at a moment in time to preserve 
the open space against the density of construction. I guess, for us, we need to think again about how we densify our cities. The green belt turns the city back in on itself. It means that infrastructures begin to work. Trains, buses, light rail, trams, so that the city can begin to work harder and we don't have to rely on cars. Um, the green belt creates a buffer zone which is about allowing the city to breathe and to extend out, to have leisure space, and importantly that suburban sprawl just doesn't connect between one village to the next, that there is, there is a, a sense of space between them. In some ways, London is a medieval city. It's not a planned city. And it should constantly be reviewing these measures and controls, the aspect and access to all things. For us, I think we look to Cedric Price again um, and his, his New York project a lung for a city. And in some ways, our project draws lots of confidence from his approach. His radical thinking about what society actually requires, the residents and the visitors. He resisted the formal development of a building. In fact, he proposed no buildings in his submission here. Um, instead proposing a civic open space that allowed for the socialization of the city. It challenged not only the question that the competition was asking, but society as a whole, and architects' actual our responsibility in making cities which are generous and benefit all people. In this sense, our project is questioning the territory that an architect should be involved in. How can we improve our cities? when the definition of our scope remains at the limits of the boundaries of our site or building. Very rarely architecture has the ability to ascend to the scale of a city unless you have a city architect. The last project I want to show you um, is um, probably the most vivid experience we've had as, as, as architects working in London. Um, some 18 months into our practice, we, were, we won the commission to design um, the 7 July Memorial for the bombings in London. Um, before I tell you about that, I'd like to talk about some of the unique collaborations we, we are part of in London that inform these kind of projects. Um, this is Anthony Gormley's Blind Light at the Hayward Gallery. Our experience of working with Anthony um, as an artist um, began working on his studio with uh, David Chipperfield Architects and after that, uh, a series of other projects. As an artist who studies the body in space, we became acutely aware of the impact of proportion of things and the figure and the inhabitant in the space. Anthony's primary a sculptor. I mean, he does draw and he does paint, but let's call him a, a sculptor for the moment. And his specific form that requires one to consider the object in space. Um, not absent of it. As such, the element you look at, the material, the form, the proportion of those elements, all of those elements that make up the space, in fact, are important to the composition of the actual artwork. They are in relationship with each other. Furthermore, the people's memories bring immense context to how we look at things. Anthony talked to us about the domesticity of spaces. He talked about the territory of the body, um, the shape of a pitched roof or ceiling relating to a figure, and the understanding of the head, shoulders, and body in a room. In this way, we acknowledge that space, shape, material, form, and even smell all matter. Um, we don't show this image very often. Um, I'm really trying to illustrate that what we did as architects on this project was not to bring identity to the project, but actually to make architecture disappear. But in these unique collaborations, one is able to make observations about what we do as architects in a unique way. Anthony came to us with the idea of walking to a cloud. Not just dry ice, a cloud. A cloud is suspended water held in suspension in air within a very specific pressure and temperature range so it doesn't condense into water again. These, these are condensing units that are used in greenhouses, and we found a very interesting mechanical engineer to work to get that balance exactly right. 
but the proportion of everything we did mattered. In doing a project like this, the observations become quite potent. And when one walked into this cloud, this, this um, blind light, as Anthony referred to it, um, you had an immersive experience. It was an interesting one because most people froze. Most people, their brain was telling their feet to move, but they wouldn't move because your eyes are open, but you can't see. So your immediate reaction is to put your hands out in front of you and feel for some Cartesian coordinates that give your body a sense of what way is up or down in space. That was very unique because not only did it bring people into a complete tactile relationship with the architecture, the, the glass of the pavilion, it brought them to the edges, the periphery of the space, it also brought them into contact with each other. So you had this unique, social, immersive, individual experience. And then we observed you step back from this, this glazed pavilion and you, and you look at people and you suddenly realize that there's a collective experience here. This is, this is us all sharing this experience and we're now seeing the artwork as actually almost like one of Anthony's ink drawings where people are fading into as figures into this, this cloud. So there was a singular and a collective experience and that became really important to us. The memorialization of, of, um, of an event like this, a tragedy, um, it now occurs first in the media and I don't think we can go past the meteorization of, of these kind of events. This must be the most memorable, visceral image that exists of, of what happened in London when these three, uh, four bombs went off across London. Um, the bus being the, obviously the most um, physical of those that was, that was recorded. The collective public consciousness of this event had sort of been already established in these images. And for us, when we started looking at the project as a, as a competition, and it was a competition, um, we had to return to our processes as, as an architect to start. What was interesting about the competition, it was an open tender, um, we were the only architect shortlisted and we found out after we were the only architect that applied. In fact, we were shortlisted against eight artists. So it got us thinking about when architects have designed some of the most important memorials in the world, Luchin's Cenotaph, which has been replicated all over this country, um, how have we lost the territory and ability to, to respond in this way with architecture, to deal with society's re needs, requirements? So to us, it was really interesting. We went in to present to this client and we said, we won't be able to give you an idea of what this thing looks like, but we can talk about the site because we're good at that. This is a hunting ground, this is Hyde Park. Actually, it's not a design park. It, was, it evolved over time. These paths were where someone walked every day from work to home or to the pub. And it was eventually formalized as a path. And when they eventually enclosed that path, um, sorry, the park with a fence, that became a gate. And so this park is a crisscrossing of desire lines. And interestingly, in the 1970s, they widened Park Lane. And we realized they shortened one of the paths. They chopped it off. So we talked to them about paths and knitting into a place and how we could place a memorial just thinking about a path. We talked about the history of the place. The eastern edge of Hyde Park was part of the Civil War defences um, uh, formed uh, in London. And these, these Civil War defences formed berms, broadly, um, landscape elements to keep people out. And some of those berms still exist. And we think they're really important features and they should be re both retained and protected. We talked to them about what memorials are. Yeah, a civilian disaster memorial is not a war memorial and it can't be 
replicated with the same figurative element of maybe someone holding a gun or charging over a, a trench. Nor is it a natural disaster memorial. They are different again. And, and for us, they have a completely different set of value judgments and, and representational challenges. But we did realize one key thing after working with Anthony Gormley on that project, and that was that we had to come to terms with both the singular loss, we had 52 clients who didn't want to be clients. Yeah? And the collective loss, actually this had to mean something to everyone in London, not just these families. So we had to look beyond our client, and we had to understand how a group of people could give you the sense that this could have been anyone. This was a cross-section through society was taken. So a single life, a single element. Four locations in clusters and 52 elements representing 52 lives lost. Not 52 people, 52 lives lost. An immersive experience, one where the living walks amongst the representative elements of the dead, one where you have to explore to understand. You have to come into close proximity with the architecture. One that included a plaque that recorded names at the end of a pathway that's extended out of and knitted into the fabric of the park. That plaque recorded the names, but they were reshuffled. They were reshuffled from the four bombings to be one record, everyone together. Some of those names were grouped out of alphabetical order. Some of those brought in people's nicknames. These were personal things. This was not a war memorial. This said, these are people we're recording. This is not a gravestone, and nor did it try to be. We wanted that this cluster of elements that represented lives lost to work at some points almost as a solid form. Solid architecture holding light within the dark um, canopy of the, of the park. The standing stones, or stelae as we've called them, um, have got to resist quite a lot in their, in their material. They've had to absorb emotion in lots of ways in the current generation. They've had to absorb protest. We think this is a good thing, that something can be adapted for part of the discussion in society about how we reconcile things as a memorial. And it's had to absorb some sort of routine. Um, it was never invented or designed. It was never part of the brief that the Prime Minister would present flowers walking through a field of elements. Um, but it's had to absorb all of that within its territory. The standing stones, we wanted to be stoic. No moving parts, no electricity. It still works if the fountain's not on, if the light's not on. It's standing there for generations to come, and in fact, we look to our client as being generations to come. This still has to mean something. So each standing stella reco recorded the date, the, ta the time, and the place of each life lost. It doesn't record the names. The names are on the plaque. These are anonymous Londoners taken it from us, and we were trying to instill the sense that by discovering that these were within minutes of each other in four locations across London, that there was a sense that this could have been anyone. We worked particularly hard on the material of the memorial with Anthony, and um, um, for us, it was, it was quite a difficult discussion with the client. We convinced them in the end to go with stainless steel. Not stainless steel like we see it in a shop front or a facade of a commercial building, but sandcast stainless steel. So what we were doing was taking one former, pressing it into sand, so taking the singular element, pressing it into sand 52 times, and then pouring molten stainless steel in an open cast. At about 1,600 degrees, it solidifies within four seconds. So within an instant, you're recording a life lost. 
that casting process was almost volcanic. It folded, it, it made each element unique through its making process. So we accepted all of those peculiarities of that casting process. We, we celebrated those. And in fact, the, the faces of the memorial, the open cast versus the other faces, record all of those, those individual qualities, those characteristics. Um, obviously, we had, had a template that, that made this distinct and separate inscription for each of the, uh, the locations. And we see somehow the visitor, the living, completing the memorial. And we step back from it once again. And we realize watching people walk through the memorial is actually the social and shared experience in coming to terms with our time and place. Um, if I can, I'd like to conclude with another image of London. Um, this image, I started with an image um, of Hogarth. Um, this, this image is, is a really important one to our studio. Um, <clears throat> it's a photograph taken on the 19th of July, 1919, of Sir Edward Lutyens, capturing the moment in time that he walked away from the unveiling of the Cenotaph, Britain's official war memorial in Whitehall. The image illustrates a fascinating paradox in the represented representation of architecture to us. In fact, this is a temporary memorial. It was built from plywood, chicken wire, plaster, and paint. It was built in 14 days before the peace celebrations it took place in commemoration of the almost a million dead in the empire in World War I. Once again, this is a temporary memorial. Despite its temporary condition, the physical presence garnered such public acclaim that it was permanently rebuilt the year after, in 1920. Its sole purpose as a memorial was and remains to stop people forgetting, resist amnesia, forgetting those who laid down their lives in the conflict for the sake of others. Its architecture provides a territory around the memorial for public ritual and commemoration, in bringing together of people for the mutual benefit and support of one another, in order to make sense of our changed world. It's reassuring that with such a limited means, once again, plywood, plaster, a bit of chicken wire, some paint, that architecture has in its means not only the language, but an ambiguous, abstract, silent thing is possible to have the power to eloquently imply the unsayable almost a century after it was commissioned as an architectural idea. There are a few aspects which are important to us in this image. Firstly, being in the presence of architecture is a powerful, regardless of its lifespan or its permanence. Um, even in this example, a memorial with none of the tenets of architecture, shelter or, or enclosure, um, creates a powerful presence in its space or its territory. Um, that architecture has the ability to heighten a connection between people and place, and in fact, a moment in time. And really importantly, the architect is walking away from the work. It reminds us of our responsibility as architects to make sense, make buildings that make sense in their own physical terms. I guess this evening I've shown you a range of projects from the temporary to the permanent. Um, these projects remind us of how important temporary and permanent work and equally, each of them equally have a profound um, place um, in our studio and a command of the territory within architecture. We're interested in the physical capacity of architecture to provoke an experience in its presence, its territory if you will an experience that can be shared, discussed, and bring people together. Together in a way that unrealized projects and other representations of architecture maybe cannot. We're interested in how the physical properties of architecture can reveal 
other layers of meaning and relate to other ideas. Architecture has a constant and changing, continuously changing relationship with, as I said at the beginning, history, culture, economics and social issues of the city, which we try to make sense of through the realm of experience. Um, the scope and endeavours of the projects in our studio remain cons concerned with how these values of humanity are connected with the making of architecture and how they in turn make sense of our times. This is the territory of our practice. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin, for your rich presentation. Please join me for a conversation um, on the stools over here. I'll just start with a few comments and then some brief questions before we end the evening. That's a very powerful project for you to end on and a very astute set of concluding remarks related to architecture and to people. I'm even more impressed with your research, rigour, strategic thinking and poetic touch than I was um, before seeing your presentation. And waiting over a year to get you here has been well worth it. So thank you. Let's go back. At the beginning, you made a point of telling us how you've immersed yourself right in the centre of London. You've told me you didn't leave Australia expecting to start your practice in London, but that is what you've done. So tell us what it was like to be an outsider in London and what it's been like to transition from study and experience in Australia to gaining experience and starting a practice in the UK. Um, first of all, um, I, I didn't expect to necessarily stay um, in London. It was always a chance to get a different experience and to um, see some of these buildings I'd studied uh, in books and come to terms with them, learn from them. Um, uh, London is a pretty contagious city, and for us, um, we find it a, a vivid and, and um, energetic experience to be right in the middle of the city, to be part of it, to see that. You also realise that that's generated out, out of a confluence of people all coming to London to do the same thing and to experience that together. So there's an immense energy, there's an incredible... Um, amount of talent and ambition in the city and I think that's somehow reflected in, in not only the people who work in our studio but probably some of the work that we've done in 10 years. I'm impressed with how significant strategic thinking is and how it underpins the design process in all of your projects. You spoke about the tactics of an architect and of how we affect things and how we inspire people. While there is a poetic overlay and many other aspects to the work, the fundamentals of each project are built on that strategic thinking. Can you elaborate on how important this approach is to you? Um, I guess um, Andy Grok and I are always trying to reconcile discussions and I think that's a good word, um, reconciliation. I think we, we, are, we are thinking about things in different ways, um, but there's a conversation that, that, that's happening in the work, which is we sometimes describe as um, uh, one, one pen, two coffees, perhaps, that we're, we're, we're drawing together. And, and that conversation is, is, I guess, evolving some of those ideas. Um, However, I would say that we are always looking for ideas in architecture, and we discuss very early on in any project what we think are the important ideas in any one project and how they might evolve from there. 
So I guess we, we are a bit strategic in setting those out in the early parts of the conversation. It seems a very important part and we'll come back to talk a little more in a little more detail about how you and Andy work and how the office works. But the title of your talk is The Territory of Architecture and you emphasise the word territory throughout your presentation. Has this term grown out of your Australian perspective? And can you elaborate on why territory is such an important word and such an important thing to you? Okay. Um, I think um, we, we wrote this lecture specifically for coming to Australia. Um, and I guess in doing so, we've reflected a little bit on some of the differences and some of the um, uh, similarities in, in our upbringings. Um, Andy obviously grew up in England and has a very different relationship. Um, climatologically, you have a different relationship with landscape. Um, however, we think that this idea of uh, the reconciliation between, between the room and landscape or room and the city is, is, is one that um, is, a shared, is a shared value between us um, coming from those different backgrounds. Um, uh, I'm reminded as I travel around Australia of how potent the landscape is in Australia and, and, and how in that early project in Cowra, how the territory of shadow, in fact, is completely different to how one would think about moving around a city in, in Europe. One doesn't walk down the shady side of streets um, in Paris, uh, but one would do that in Melbourne you know, on a hot day and, and follow the shadow between trees and buildings and that that forms a way of how we inhabit the city and how we use it and that's a, a changing relationship always with, with our climate and that seems, um, it's hard to generalize around that but it seems really relevant here and it seems um, uh, an interesting observation we're making into, into work it, that we're doing in London. Yes, I think it's apparent that you've got your f filter and you're translating what you see into something that they don't see. Perhaps. And as an Australian, you're now teaching the British about how to do landscape, perhaps? Um, I think the British have a very rich tradition of pi the picturesque um, and, and the ideal of... Um, uh, I guess, looking and framing views at landscape. Um, but I think that's a very different idea of when you come to the threshold of the building. Mm. Okay, so speaking of landscape, the idea of creating a landscape and then mining underneath that landscape sounds so incredible. Yet you won the competition and with that idea and are moving forward and have been moving forward for nine years. How has this project remained alive and how have you maintained your stamina on that project? Um, I, I, guess, I guess we always thought it would take a long time to position the project. I guess part of what we're doing, the tactic of that project is, is working politically. Um, it's, it's positioning the project as the preferred sustainable minerals resource within that borough. It's working with the mayor to ensure that that's within his strategic framework for how he's thinking about um, public open space in the city, in the green belt, beyond. Um, but it's also sort of thinking about how we, we, we do things in the city. It now makes us think, why should any warehouses be above ground? Why have got these big buildings? They could all be using mining sites. We could, we could find these sites where we remove resources and we, we make buildings in their place and somehow there's, there's a kind of hand-in-hand -hand relationship with that, that sustainable development and the extraction of minerals and then, let's face it, we're using the minerals to make the buildings so it feels, it feels like that's a cyclical process. Um, the stamina side of things is is one that we're not just doing one project. So that, that project gets picked up and taken along through nine years and it'll have moments where you put it down and you have to pick it up again and take it to the next level. And I think that's as much credit to the, to the very talented team that we have that, that, that maintain these things whilst 
whilst we're thinking about other ideas. But it's also about you maintaining your client's interest and them maintaining the belief that this idea is still worth pursuing. Sure. One of the reasons for that is financial, of course, but you've still had quite an incredible idea and someone is following it through. That's pretty special. Um, yeah, I think um, initially we, we won the project saying we could extract the gravels and get you this much money. Um, uh, I don't think we talked about the park. Um, but, but in the back of our minds, we were always thinking an infrastru infrastructure project of this scale for the city should give something back, so how could it? And I, and I guess the park came not, not in the first in, you know, version of the idea, but it, but it developed and evolved through time. And really interestingly, this went through a public planning process and we had two objections. Yeah, as a, because, because actually the process is benign and we're giving a, a park within 18 months to a community that don't have one. Obviously, it'll evolve, and the trees will grow, and it'll, it'll, it, the extraction of gravels will move down within that park as cells, but the park can be used. So, so actually, the, the approach somehow benefited the community first, and the client second. You spoke about the relationship between the room and the city. You spoke of Sir John Soane, and you showed the models inside his museum and then inside your office. Then you've gone and proposed building a room around Hill House. Again, another radical idea, yet so appropriate. It's apparent how much you understand the relationship between architecture and culture, and, about, and how important it is to you that architecture is about people, that it's a backdrop for life and for people. My comment before the question is, how enlightened and intelligent of the Scottish National Trust to believe in and support your idea? It's not quite what we might expect from our National Trust. It's a very different understanding, I think. And what a great way to experience the historic work, um, to walk around and above and over this building that is so special in the history of architecture, but allowing people to experience it in so many different ways and to be a part of that process of its rehabilitation, mm. let's call it. Um, so you've proposed a temporary structure, yet it could be there for 100 years. Tell us more about how this idea has been received. Um, uh, first of all, um, they are quite a visionary client. Um, they have really supported this idea when it came through the competition and more than that, they see the value of it on many other projects. Um, I, for us, um, you know, it, it's planned to be there for 15 years, but you can't get a temporary planning permission. So this has full planning permission to be built. So the question is, when do you take it down? Um, I don't think we want to speculate on that. I think what we are trying to do is give enough time in the process for society to have the debate about how we should conserve our buildings. Um, I mentioned in the talk the, the unusual ethical question this building chat proposes, which is, should we put the same render back? And, and it causes the same problem, or should we use a modern material which isn't going to be on, honest in its interpretation of conservation to preserve it? Should we put in damp proof courses? Shall we? Shall we repair the things he got wrong being a very young architect? Um, and I think that's a really interesting conversation and it one that should engage society, not just architects. And hopefully the project allows that discussion before this building just completely dissolves. So hopefully it's just buying us time to, and, then we, and then we can work out what to do. Mm. So like the mining idea, it's an idea that could be applied in many different ways. You've set an example. How beautiful. Um, and I was going to comment also after something you said, maybe you've found that important respect as an architect, similar to what you described regarding the original Sheffield housing project, where the architects were respected. 
something we don't always get. Okay, now let's talk about the practice. Um, you and Andy both worked for David Chipperfield. How did your experience there influence how you now work in your own practice? Um, I think probably one of the, the very uh, visceral, um, real connections one might make is, is the idea of models. Um, I think uh, models do a number of things uh, in our studio. Every project is, is de designed and developed through a range of scales in models. Um, why do we use models? Um, they slow the process down. Okay, You can render 40 versions of something, but if you have to think about it and actually make it and come to terms with how it goes together, its proportions, its junctions, its corners, then you're probably thinking about it. And so, first of all, the idea of slowing down the design process for everyone in the studio, we think is a really beneficial thing. The second is, is, is one that um, we probably um, learned from David's office, and that is that models are quite democratic. They're not authored by any one person. In fact, everyone can engage with them. A render out of a computer even has the perspective of the person that wants you look, to look at the building in that way, whereas a model allows you to interpret and look at it in lots of ways, collectively, at the same time. Um, we can also evolve design decisions democratically within the studio, so everyone can input into that process. Clients, people in the studio, consultants. So they're really valuable tools. I think the second part of, sorry to go on, the second part no, of the question is, it, I would say, it is a very simple one. Um, in, I think David is always thinking like a foreigner and building like a local. And I would say that's probably what we've done coming to London. And I think that's probably something we learnt in his studio. Okay, following on from that, a two-part question. First of all, tell us how you and Andy collaborate on projects. And then, with an office of now over 40 people, how do you all work as a team on this broad range of projects? Okay. Um, I, I probably talked a little bit about working with Andy um, uh, uh, in, in, that, in that direct conversation. Um, I, I guess, um, look, it's a, it's a hard thing to describe, but we made some rules early on in that design process about being able to say anything to each other <laughs> about what we thought, um, so not getting offended, not getting um, uh, defensive. Um, uh, but we also thought about the process. We've always thought about design as additive. So we don't say, oh, that doesn't work, we need to do something else. We always think, what's another way of approaching that problem? How, do, how can we add another layer to that and think about the problem looking from a different direction? And somehow that makes the conversation between two people additive. And between that, we reconcile the projects. So there are tests, and there's many tests, and there's um, evolving tests of, of ideas um, that lead to the completed projects. They're not just um, one person's view. And then with the office, perhaps elaborate a little more on that, and particularly what you do on Fridays. Yeah, sure. Um, so um, the studio has um, uh, a group which has been with us seven or eight years, right, right from the beginning, which, uh, which managed to run the studio. For, they're, they're very experienced and talented architects in their own right. And, and, and so they're, they're kind of pushing forward a lot of the agenda. We sit down with, on Fridays together, the two directors with that team and review the projects with, with each of the groups working on those projects. And I guess in a way it's become a bit like an academic model where you would do crits on, on a certain day and we block out that whole day, there's no client meetings. I'm in Australia on the day tomorrow, but apart from that, um, we tend to be pre fairly strict with that. And, and, it's, and it's really great because we're having that conversation um, together to push things forward. Very important, very important aspect. In ending, our discussion. Um, 
I know that a few days ago you were in Florence for a potential project. Maybe you can't talk about that project. But in closing, can you give us an indication about any upcoming projects we might like to look out for? Um, so I guess today we've talked quite a lot of unusual and cultural projects. The studio has a range of scales and um, we're working on four or five museum projects. Um, we are still doing temporary projects. Uh, we're doing some furniture. Um, we're doing exhibition design. Um, uh, we're doing a, a hotel tower in London and a, a large housing project in Milan, amongst others. So there's a breadth of scale and diversity that we find really energizing and interesting. We, we continue to see each project as a new opportunity. Okay. As I mentioned earlier, this is only a small proportion of the Carmody Groke uh, portfolio. Please make the effort, take the brochure with you, learn a little bit about their work, have a look at the website. There's a lot more work there and a lot more interesting ideas to engage with. Please join me in thanking our guest, Kevin Carmody. Now, before we all leave, um, it's time for the special prize. Underneath one seat, there is a ticket. Please yell out if you have that ticket. And if it's not your seat, look under the one next to you. Come on. Surely we have... Oh, there we go. We've got a winner. Come on down. Congratulations. Come and get your prize. There you go. Go over there and we'll get a photo oh. with you and, you and Kevin. There we go. Look this way. Okay, now thank you all for taking the time to come and see us tonight. As with all Brickworks talks, this, one of the special things is you can come and talk to our guest speaker. So please... Don't be shy, come and have a chat to him. He's very happy to talk to you. There's gonna be some more food and drink for everybody. Um, and we'll see you again in a month's time for another talk. Thank you again and please thank Kevin again. <laughs>